and I didn't talk about anything we didn't know yet. Thank you, though. So we have high electronegativity and low. Fair enough. We should know that. Okay, these trends can be understood qualitatively through electronic structure of the atoms. What that means is like 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, all that stuff. That's what we mean by electronic structure. The shell model, that means as we add, we add concentric rings um, and they're really shapes, right? But that's harder to draw than just rings. But as we add and the electrons move farther, all right? And then also Coulomb's law. Coulomb's law is like the fundamental concept whenever we talk about forces. And when we talk about forces, we're talking about like the shapes, we're talking about the size of atoms, all that stuff, Coulomb's law. And we're gonna get into it again. You can be like, he already taught me this. Well, I'm gonna teach it again. Okay, so here we go. Electronegativity, sort of already talked about it. You can write it down if you need to, but electronegativity is the ability of atoms in a molecule to attract electrons to itself. Does that sound familiar? It's on the thing I gave you the last couple of days. On the periodic chart, electronegativity increases as you go from left to right. So it gets bigger this way and it gets bigger that way on this chart. Kind of weird how it spun, I guess, but that's how it came. So F has a high, FR has a low. What's that? Right here. That's when you get to the Ds. And those would be the non-representative. So they're kind of weird. So generally speaking, we go up and up. Generally. Are we sort of so far okay? All right. Let's talk a little bit about what matters for what we're going to be doing here. And that is what I like to call the end. And you'll see why. And it's not really three words, but I don't like writing electronegativity differences. N is way better. You with me? So if I put E and D today, I mean the electronegativity difference, which I know is two words, but you'll be fine. Negativity difference. Okay, so I'm gonna to move to the next slide. It has the chart in a not sideways way. And you can ignore this. This is just a chart. It's the periodic table I stole, uh, just the picture or the whatever, image from regular chemistry. On this periodic chart, it shows just the representative elements, the S's, and the P's and ignores the D's. You okay with that? All right, on this chart, it has the electronegativity values right here. And just, just quickly, not, did I say differences? It's just the electronegativity value. So if you notice right here, whoops. We have some high. You all right with that? Uh, we have some low. All right, we, well, I'm just gonna say like all oh, these are low. You okay with that? Uh, whatever, we have some mediums. All right, and then we have some like low mediums. I don't know, you don't, you don't have to color it this way, but just to kind of get an idea of, it's really low here, sort of increases, kind of big, really big. You with me? Okay. What's that? This is just electronegativities and I'm finding them by these values. Now AP never requires you to know those numbers. They're, they're the electronegativities, they're measured in D bytes, but you don't have to know them, they'll be given to you. But you dang well should know fluorine has a really high one. And you should know over here has a really low one. And then you should know atoms close together, their E and D would be small. Atoms far away from each other, their electronegativities would be large. 
You with me? Just the basics right now. Just the basics. So when we talk in a minute about the differences in electronegativity, we literally mean these numbers, big minus small. The like numerical differences. So if I have H, F bonding together, I would find a four. I would find a 2.1. And then I would subtract the small from the big. I know this seems so wrong that I'm going this way. And I would end up with the difference is 1.9. You okay with that? That's all we're talking about. And that difference is kind of big, but not ginormous. Okay. So we're going to talk about electronegativity differences and its applications to types of bonds. You don't have this periodic table and you don't need it, but like in regular chemistry, it tells you that an ionic bond is a difference greater than 1.7. A polar is a middle one and a nonpolar is a small one. We'll, we'll learn all this stuff. Okay, so electronegativity, big here, small here. And to find the difference, you would be given numbers and you would subtract them. Okay, chemical bonds. This will hopefully come together. There are three basic types of bonds. Now, I know I said there's four. There's these three, and then there's the weird one, and then the one that doesn't really count, but we call it a bond anyway, and that's hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding is in a whole different chapter and unit than this one is. So don't, like, don't just remember it's a thing, but we'll come up to it later. So the three basic parts are ionic, which is an electrostatic attraction. We're going to go over each one in depth. So don't stress too much. Then we have a covalent bond. Oh, yeah, it does have metallic because it didn't break covalent in half. I'm sorry. So covalent bonds are where electrons are shared. And then a metallic bond. That's where metal atoms bond to several other metal atoms. All right. I see you all writing down. You're welcome to do that. And now we're going to break them down. We're going to go in not that same order. I hope that doesn't annoy anyone. We're going in the order AP. The stuff on the left, this is an ionic compound, magnesium oxide, potassium uh, dichromate and nickel two oxide. And then this would be bromine. These are nonpolar um, and then metallic. So it's just showing you, whoops, I hate when I do that. It's showing you ionic up here and then nonpolar, or I should say covalent. I keep saying it incorrectly. And then metallic at the bottom. Kind of okay with that? All right. So here we go. This is from regular chem. And don't, you don't need to write it down. Just stick with me for a minute. We've talked about valence electrons, have we not? Right? When we did the configurations, when we got to a new level, we called that a valence electron. Valence electrons are the electrons in the highest occupied energy level of an atom. So if I were to draw the diagram, I'll just do it on here. Um, oh no, bright yellow, really small. If I had Na, so I'd have my boxes and I would fill them up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. I'd have one S, two S, two P, three S. Anywhere where I complete the noble gas, so this is neon, right? Anything above the previous noble gas is the valence electron. When we drew the short configurations, we were accounting for the valence electrons. Does that sound familiar? All right, so valence electrons are the electrons in the highest occupied energy level. Now, if I had <clears throat> 3P, And let's say I had one, two, three. Tell your partner how many valence electrons I have now in this. 
You hear silence. Have I just suddenly got super boring? I have, huh? I need a story. I don't have time for stories. <laughs> okay. If you think it's three, hold up your hand. If you think it's five, hold up your hand. Okay. The answer is five. To listen, to determine valence electrons, you go to the previous noble gas and it's everything after that. So it's the two in the S and the three here. This atom is phosphorus, right? You can also find the valence electrons by saying in row three, it's one, two, three, four, five over. You can do that. There's also an easiest way to do it. What family is phosphorus in? Family five. The valence electrons are equal to the family. Now, all of this is for the representative elements again, which is S and P's, but it's really simple. The number of valence electrons is equal to the family number. Are we okay with that? The number of valence electrons is equal to the family number. So Na had how many valence electrons? It had one, which I'm gonna draw as a dot. And this is tomorrow, the dots. Phosphorus has how many valence electrons? It has five, one, two, three, four, five. Now I know I drew that in a weird way. I went one, two, three, four, five. Look at me for a second. When I got to the third row, I went one, two together and then separate, separate, separate. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Question? Yep, it's the same as the boxes. Now we'll go over this pretty quick tomorrow and then say it's kind of like this, but yada, yada, whatever. All right, but valence electrons, the outermost. So here we go. You got to raise your hands here. Show me how many valence electrons anything in family one has. Ready, go. One. How many in family two? Two, be careful. How many in family five? Five, not three. Yeah, how many in eight? Eight, that's the easiest thing ever, right? What's that? It will never be zero. Now you're like, family eight is full. Does it have any? Does it have all of them? That's a debate forever, all right? It's like whether the dress was whatever or whatever two colors, it's the same. It's a freaking dress, all right? Okay, here we go. The next slide is super important. If we combine what we know about electronegativity and we know what we know about the octet rule, then we're ready to do science. So I have a question. Musician, how many notes in an octet? Eight, all right. How many people are in an octet? Eight. Eight. How many sides of an octagon? Eight. How many legs in an octopus? What month is October? Tenth one. Oh. <laughs> the eighth month. No, it's not. It's so stupid. I don't know why. But but the but oct means eight, right? Look here. The octet rule says that atoms react by changing the number of electrons so as to acquire the stable electron structure of a noble gas. What family are the noble gases in? Eight. So all atoms pretty much want eight or zero, which means they have eight in the lower shell, valence electrons. Now there is an exception. What atom is in family eight, but doesn't actually have eight electrons? Helium. Helium. It only needs two to fill its octet. You okay with that? And we mean octet is eight usually or to become like family eight. So hydrogen, not gonna gain seven. It only needs to gain one to become an octet. Yes. You sure can. Okay, now I'm gonna teach from this slide. Go ahead. A hundred million percent easier to lose than to gain seven. And that's why we've said 
Metals are losers. They have low ionization energies and really low exothermic electron affinities. So there's multiple reasons why they will lose and who's gonna take? The non-metals. Okay, this slide, you're welcome to just write with me, but you don't have to. So this slide really can teach us everything we need to know. And after this slide, I'm still gonna teach stuff because I just, I can't. So atoms react by changing the number of electrons. Okay, atoms that react by losing electrons, they have a name. Nope, we'll get there eventually. They are metals. So metals lose electrons. Metals lose electrons. All right. When they lose electrons, they have a new name, kind of. They are ions. I'm going to get rid of this line because it's in my way. When a metal loses, it becomes a cat ion. Have we gone over that before? Okay. A cat ion has what charge? All right, it's a positively charged cat ion. It lost a negative electron. So it now has more protons, which are pluses, than it has minuses. More pluses than minuses, you become positive. Are we okay with that? Okay, so metals lose electrons for a ton of reasons. They want eight, but it has one. So like potassium, if it's in family 19, it wants to be like family 36, not family, sorry. It has 19 elements, or <laughs> 19 electrons. It wants 18 or 36, which is easier. 19. So potassium will give up its single valence electron to become like argon. It's a loser. Speak. Is that why there's a lower electronegativity? Absolutely. <laughs> but it's not why, I should, I should say actually no. It's not why they have a low electronegativities. It's a consequence of them having low electronegativities. And let's review real quick. Sorry. Family one has low electronegativities because they have the lowest what word you never heard before two days ago? Zeph. They have the lowest Zeph. So that's why they have low electronegativities. This is a consequence of them having low electronegativities is they lose easily. All right, fair enough. Okay, now who on the periodic table is going to gain an electron? Non-metals. Non-metals react by gaining electrons. Uh, so to acquire the stable, stable electron structure of a noble gas. Okay, we have names besides non-metals. We have names when they gain an electron. An anion, you guys are awesome. And it's what charge? Negative because if it gains an, a negative, it now has more minus than protons, you have more negatives, you are negative. Are we okay with that? Okay, now this is important to know. A metal cannot become a cation unless, anyone know? There's a non-metal to take it. This process, they have to happen together. If a metal doesn't have a non-metal to give its electrons to, then it's just a metal, it's a metallic bond. If a non-metal doesn't have a metal to steal from, it's going to form what we're gonna call a different type of bond, which we'll go over in a second. Okay, are we ready? This is magic. When this process happens and it always happens together, the cation, which is positive, and the anion, which is negative, are actually then attracted to each other. And they form an electrostatic attraction that forms a bond that we call an ionic bond.
for all intents and purposes, which is chemistry for saying not all the time, but most of the time. An ionic bond is a bond between a metal and a non-metal because an ionic bond has to have ions. They have to be oppositely charged. And really the only way for that to happen is for a metal to lose and a non-metal to gain. Fair enough. All right, so that is the like nuts and bolts of an ionic bond. A metal loses, a non-metal gains, and then life's fantastic. Why did I make this choice in my life? Let's see. Um, okay. Still okay about that? Okay. I want to emphasize something real quick here. A lot of you gave me a Mountain Dew for my birthday, correct? Did any of you expect to share that bottle with me? Sure. No. <laughs> That'd be weird. You show up from 7-Eleven, you're like, here's the Mountain Dew, and it has two straws in it? <laughs> that doesn't happen, right? When you give someone a Christmas or a birthday present, you used to have it, and now you give it. Is it yours anymore? No. Are you sharing it then? No, you're not. Be really careful here. So in an ionic bond, I need you to really know this. They do not share electrons. The metal completely loses. The non-metal completely takes. And then they're both happy. But there's not a shared electron. So the only reason they hang out together is because they're oppositely charged not because they're sharing a pair of electrons. That's why they're super strong bonds, but you put them in water and they just fall apart. Exactly, because they're not sharing electrons, they're electrostatically attracted. So if I give them something else more attractive, well, they're out. Go. So non-metals will share, and that's where we're going right now. And it's when there's no other option. So, so understand this part right here. And we're not going to write it down. But no non-metal wants to share. Like most of you, unless you're just built different, you didn't want to share a room with your sibling. Triplets, you guys ever have to share? It's a mansion. Never mind, I've seen it. Maybe when you were little. You want your own room, right? Non-metals, they don't want to share. So they're always out there hunting to steal an electron. All right, so if they can find a metal, they're gonna do it. Okay, so here we go. Losing metals, gaining non-metals, but what happens when we share? What type of atoms? Nope, nope. Two non Metals. Whoa. Not metalloids. Everyone wants to say metalloids. She's like, well, that makes sense. We got metals, not metals, and boop, boop, boop. no. What? Metalloids act both ways. So sometimes they lose, sometimes they gain. Okay. So the only time when we share electrons is when two non-metals are together. Because two non-metals, look at the screen, I'll use my temperature probe here, two non-metals want to gain. It's only 71 degrees, which is what room temperature is. So it's this normal, all right? So the non-metals want to gain, but if there are two of them, do they have a metal to steal from? No, so their only option is to share electrons so that they can both gain, all right? So when two non-metals share electrons, let me kind of draw out how this looks. I don't know if I've already drawn this or not, but I'm gonna draw fluorine in boxes. 
All right, this is fluorine. And I'm not going to put the 1s, as you'll see why in a second. But so I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. If it could just fill this one, it would be like a noble gas. But it can't because it doesn't have a metal to steal from. It would love to, because remember, who's the hottest of them all? Thank you. And second is fluorine, all right? Really, it was my wife, if you paid any attention. Um, all right, here we go. I'm gonna group that. I would, I would probably hurt you. Okay, so here we go. Here are two fluorine atoms, right? And they're both unhappy. They would love to go find a metal, but there isn't one. But they're very unstable. So they make a mutual agreement and they say, all right, let's do this. If we just share our outer electron, then we'll both feel happy. What type of bond is this? Look at me. Look at me. What did we call these outer electrons? The valence electrons, and they are sharing them, right? The valence electrons are together, so they're called covalent bonds. Covalent bonds. They're forced to share in a covalent bond. They literally overlap their valence shells. And there you go. Be all right with that. If you're drawing this out, you can do it, but it's a lot easier if you just draw hydrogen. Because one hydrogen has that. The other hydrogen has that. And if they share, then they're together. That's why they're all diatomic. Boom! That's what? That's why they're diatomic. H has always been H2, right? It's because H with one dot is an unhappy camper. H with two dots, it feels okay. It's become like helium because it's shared. Mm, life lesson there. We're all better through sharing. But why share if we can steal? Okay, that's real chemistry. All right. Yeah. All right. Are we okay with that? So, what were my diatomics? H, F. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go in order. H, N, O, F, C, L, B, R, and I. Right. Okay. I will draw O, and then I'll move on because I'm already going longer than I want. Oxygen looks like this. And it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right. It is unhappy. It's less unhappy than fluorine, though. Fluorine is so close to being perfect. If it could just get one, and it will. Oxygen's like, I am so close to be perfect, but I need two. So it's a little harder for oxygen, or oxygen has less electronegativity than fluorine, but it's still pretty reactive. Okay, here we go. So we're gonna group it, we're gonna clone it. Whoops, it's gotta be that now. And then I'm gonna flip it, and we're gonna overlap. We okay with that? Back. And there you go. This bond is called O2. And if I were gonna draw it, which you will soon, I'd have an O and two lines. Explain. They share two pairs of electrons. They have four total electrons between them. Each line represents two. Boom, 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 boom. We're doing this tomorrow. They're called Lewis structures. What's that? They do. Right. <laughs> There's Zeph. I like it. All right. So far, pretty okay. Covalent bonds share. 
Easy enough? Coming back. All right. Sorry if you were taking a picture or whatever. So we had covalent. Go back to the I look good from both sides. The flooring. Okay. Are we all right? Okay, coming back. I want to stress something. Am I am I at white now? Yep, I am. Here we go. Covalent. Uh, they do share. Ionic? Mm -mm. Never, ever, ever, ever sharing. One goes from one place to the other. Covalent. They don't have anything better to do. So like, oh, this is shared. Hang out. All right. Now, I want to say something. It's not on the test, but make sure you know when it achieves an octet, it becomes like a noble gas. It does not become a noble gas. That require changing protons. Okay, so far so good. Are we out of here? Oh, only 10 minutes? Oh, I'm screwed. Okay, here we go. I said all this jazz, but we're back to covalent. All right, so I taught it once. We're gonna teach it again, and then we're gonna summarize it. That's the goal, but I got 10 minutes left. All right. In covalent bonds, atoms are shared because, or sorry, electrons are shared because both atoms have to gain because both atoms are non-metals. All right, in a covalent bond, there are a lot of uh, static, electrostatic interactions. You have the attractions between the minuses and the positives and the repulsions of the minus to minus and the plus to plus. It's weird. It's just a hot mess in there. Okay, don't stress a ton about that yet. Yes. So, like, what in what scenario is that happening? This is hydrogen bonded to hydrogen. Wait, then why are there four? For what? There's two two protons, two electrons. Why are they so big? Don't worry it, it doesn't really matter. But here is the fuzz that represents H2. That's the fuzz that represents H2. The electrons are found probably pretty close, probably in the middle. They could be here, but most likely they're here. Okay. Now, nonpolar. So, you will recall just two minutes ago, I talked about ionic and covalent, right? This says nonpolar covalent. So we would know first off, are they sharing? Thank you. The, the deepest voice is wrong. That's a rough day. <laughs> the answer is yes, they're sharing because covalents share. Oh, sideways. They share. Now, Non-polar. Okay. Anyone ever heard of the North Pole and the South Pole? All right. They divide our planet into halves, right? This is the axis. This is the equator. I know not drawn to scale, but polar, have I said this before? Polar means two-sided. I have said that. Okay, yesterday. Polar means two sided. So here we go. If it says non polar, it means non, not two sided. It has no sides. And what we mean by sides here, there's no defined minus or plus side. So here we go. Valence electrons, Valence electrons shared between atoms of similar electronegativity. So another way to put this is that their E and D is small. 
their electronegativity difference is small. Coming back to wrap that into what we were talking about. Um, constitute a nonpolar covalent bond. Okay. I'm sure that my TA is pretty strong, but if we were going to fight over something right here and we were going to pull, fat man's going to win, right? Okay, so we would have a large difference in electronegativity because I'm 213.1 today <laughs> and I won't guess her weight, but it's a lot smaller than that, right? So we were going to fight, I would win that battle because I have a, a lot more mass if two atoms are fighting and one's a large electronegative atom and one's a small, it's just gonna take it, right? But now we're sharing. Now we're sharing, which if we're sharing, we're only in what part of the periodic table? Over here, right? There's not a ton that share. Most of the periodic table is not, or is metals. And then there's noble gases. And then there's just these weirdies that share. Okay, you with me, sort of? So when they share, if, one second, if their differences are small, 2.5 and 2.1, the difference is 0.4, we're gonna call it nonpolar because neither one pulls very hard. It would be Amber fighting herself. Like, oh, oh it doesn't go anywhere. Okay, go. It's not a very happy relationship, uh, but it like could happen, but it's just not, no, it doesn't want to happen. Okay. But it could, sure, they could share a pair and live unhappily ever after. But they're going to go out and fight to fight something else. Okay, so a nonpolar substance drawing looks like this. These blobs represent where the electron density is. So where we'll probably find it. And it's equal pretty much everywhere. Okay, so I used actually the triplets as an example just yesterday. Did anyone say anything about it? You guys, now I know the answer because I'm teaching you or have taught you driver's ed. I know the answer to this, but typically, when I was a kid, I was a sophomore and I shared a car with my sister that was a senior. Who got it most of the time? My senior sister, right? We only shared it by definition of my mom. Like, hey, you guys shared the car. She's like, all right, it's mine. Okay. We did not share that equally. But then I've used the example and we'll just pretend the triplets are all the same age, right? Within an hour, a couple hours. Okay, so now they're gonna share a car. Now I know who's gonna get the car the most. I won't say it out loud. I know who's gonna get it the least. I'm not looking at anyone, but they would have to share more equally theoretically, right? Because their difference in age is so small or their electronegativity difference is really small. Okay, so when we get atoms on the periodic table that are sort of close together, they share their electrons pretty equally. Easy enough. Now, I know these are kind of far apart, but they're not that far apart in numbers, right? So an example, and it's just right here from AP, an example is carbon and hydrogen or hydrocarbons or carbohydrates, things you've learned about in biology. They are typically nonpolar. Fair enough. Okay, next. And that would be equal sharing. If you're like looking for a short note to yourself, nonpolar covalent means equal sharing because non means not, polar means two-sided and covalent means together. So not two-sided sharing, it means equal sharing. Um, okay, here we go. Let's just go here. So polar covalent bonds. Well, now it doesn't say non-two-sided, it just says two-sided. So now there is sharing. What's the key to know I'm still sharing? The word covalent. 
So it's not an ionic bond, but it's not a perfect equal relationship here. So valence electrons share between atoms of unequal electronegativity constitute a polar covalent bond. And we talked about water yesterday, right? In this example, we have H and F. Which of those two? Well, I'm not going to ask you that. This represents where the electron is. You okay with that? All right. Here's hydrogen. Here's fluorine. So where is the electron going? Away from H towards fluorine. We draw what we call a dipole. A dipole or dipole moment is an arrow with a plus on the end of it, showing the movement of electrons leaving this side positive. And it would make this side what? Negative. So we'd have a partial positive, a partial negative, or we'd have a two-sided molecule or a polar molecule. It's a strain sharing. It's definitely unequal. It's when I shared a car with my sister. I got it one day out of 180 days. That's not 90 and 90. That's way less. Do you share your car with Adelaide? No. Oh, my spoiled. <laughs> what in the world? Do you share your car with your little sister? Oh, my. You guys are too nice. My sister was not nice. I'm not. Your parents are too nice. That's true. All right. I didn't get, I got most of what I wanted done today. Not as much. We'll be okay.